Well, I want to give a shout out to my son Tristan. He turned six today. We're so excited. He's growing up. Yeah. He's yeah. seeing bank in six pounds because he needs it. <laughs> All right, let's stand as we begin our worship this morning with your grace is enough. seated. We have a couple of announcements as we get started this morning, and uh, we're uh, a small group this morning. Hopefully there's, I, I've seen a whole lot more people here walking around. They're probably out in the foyer talking. They're probably out there talking to Bob Potter is what they're probably telling me. <laughs> He's not listening. All right, well, as we uh, get started this morning, today will be kid-friendly worship, and so in a little bit, the kids that are with us this morning uh, will be joining us for the entire service. So there's a couple of benefits for that for you in that. Number one, I'm going to preach shorter. At least I'm going to try. And number two, we get to watch a part of Toy Story. So hopefully you'll enjoy a shorter service and a kid-friendly service today. Second, there's no PM service tonight. We'll resume those again sometime, but uh, not tonight. And then uh, special offering for Rose Rowe. Rose is leaving in January to head to Thailand, and we want to support her in that journey. She's going to be uh, partnering with her son, uh, volunteering at a Christian school there in Thailand, and uh, so we want to support her. Um, we're helping to raise some of the funds for the incidentals, all the shots and everything that she has to do. 
it's almost almost a thousand dollars just for that stuff so we want to raise money to help her with those funds so if you want to just mark your check rose row and put it in the offering plate that would be great also we're continuing to take our offering for nazarene compassion ministries for the victims of the hurricanes and uh, there's information on the the app if you'd like to do it that way or you can just put it in the offering plate and then we'll donate that immediately once we receive those funds and uh Crisis Care Kit, the details are in the bulletin and also in the, uh, the app if you want to continue to uh, provide supplies for the Crisis Care Kits. And basically what we're looking at at this point is there's not an immediate need for those Crisis Care Kits in either Florida or Texas. However, we have depleted the reserves. So we typically like to, as a denomination, have several thousand of these on hand so that when there's a crisis, we can have them loaded up and shipped to wherever the crisis is immediately. And right now our reserves are low. So uh, what we're gathering now will go to the warehouse so that it's ready to, uh, to be shipped when that need comes up. And I do have an update video this morning from um, the South Texas District Church of the Nazarene kind of doing a, a little bit of a walkthrough and, and an update on the Harvey Relief and where the funds that we've been giving have been going. Friends, I'm standing in front of the home of Pastor Ray McDowell, Pastor of Orange, First Church in Nazareth. You can see the remains of possessions behind me. It's been about four weeks since the Ray and his family were evacuated out here by airboat. And Ray's story is just one of hundreds, in, if not thousands, in this area, and many thousands more across uh, South Texas, back towards the Houston area. And the effects of those storms have been devastating, but the response of God's people has been even greater than the effects of the storm. And we're just continuing to see that. And we want to thank our Nazarene family and the full body of Christ for all the people that have come from New York to California, for the people that have contributed. And we're now at a place where it's time to start restoring and rebuilding. And so we're going to need continued contributions. We're going to need continued teams coming in. And I want to assure you that uh, if you contribute through Nazarene Compassion Ministries or through the South Texas District, that money all will go and is going to meet the needs of people devastated by the effects of Hurricane Harvey. So I encourage you to continue to pray. Go to SouthTexasNaz.org, go to NCN.org slash Harvey, give, pray, continue to believe that God is going to meet our needs. Thank you so much. Our news tends to move on quickly from one crisis to another, and the Harvey uh, hurricane is going to take a long time to recover from. This is not something that's just going to be done, or it's not done just because the, uh, uh, the storm is over. There's a, an awful lot of cleanup work. So if you'd like to continue to give to that, again, those funds will go in immediately. Well, as we continue in worship this morning, um, the background uh, this morning for our worship is down on the, the Mississippi River. And I, when I dropped Olivia off to school, I, three days this week, I just went down to the river for a few minutes to pray. And this was the first day that I was down there. It was the, the really foggy day. It was just extremely foggy and it was, it was very peaceful. Um, the next day I went down there was right after we'd gotten the six inches of rain and it was rushing and roaring and angry. And then the next day I went down there and it was sunny. I, I think sometimes Sometimes we get so caught up in um, just rushing, rushing, rushing that we don't take time to just be where we're at. We don't take time to feel what we're, what we're feeling, what we're facing. And, and this week, as we've read in Scripture, we started the book of Lamentations. And Lamentations is a very, very interesting book. It's a very challenging book. And before the kids get in here, I promise you I'm not preaching about the parents eating their kids that we read about in Lamentations this week. I'm not going to preach about that this morning when the kids are in here. Lamentations is talking about the, the challenges of, of grief. How do we express our grief? How do, we, how do we live out our challenges in life? And too often in our American culture, we don't take time to grieve. We don't take time to process the emotions that we feel. And so what I want us to do this morning, uh, as we worship, as we sing together, we want to reflect on God's faithfulness. And we're going to do that. But we also want to take time just to process the reality sometimes life is gray. Sometimes life is frustrating. And, and no matter where you're at, no matter what you're facing this morning, 
Um, allow yourself to be in that cloudy day if you need to be, but allow God's grace to peek through the clouds. Let's stand together as we continue to worship.
many times in our lives we get so busy and so caught up that we forget that God is indeed here. This morning I woke up a little bit earlier than normal. It was still dark outside and as I was spending some time in prayer, I just opened the blinds a little bit and it was a beautiful start to the day. Seeing the, the tree limbs, we have ash trees that have died and so it's just limbs. There's no leaves left. Seeing the horizon through the, through the limbs and just a peacefulness, a quiet peacefulness. And as I was laying there and, and praying, I, I could see one star in the distance. As I was looking at that star and just the reality of this, the, the movement, the rotation of the earth, <coughs> the star was moving and I had to keep adjusting my head to see the star through the lens. And I felt like God was saying, Emmanuel, as, as you go through the busyness of life, too often you just allow the distractions to get in the way and you stop looking for me. You stop looking for me when things get chaotic. You're, you're just so focused on the stuff in front of me. But this morning I was reminded of the importance of in the midst of the stuff to just keep adjusting my stuff, to keep looking for him. And maybe this morning that's what we need to do. As we sing through this chorus again, as we acknowledge the fact that he is here, he promises us that he is here with us. Maybe we need to kind of adjust ourselves a little bit so that we can see him today. We're going to sing through this chorus again, and if you would like to be seated, you can be seated. If you want to remain standing, you can remain standing. If you want to come forward, our altars are open. If you would like special prayer, Pastor Larry and Meyer will be in the corner. But I just encourage you to take some time this morning as we sing through this again, as we, as we worship Take some time to adjust yourself so that you can see him and recognize that he is here. He is here. Father, we are so thankful this morning for your presence. And we're thankful for the reminder that in the midst of the craziness of life, that you are still here. But Father, we also recognize as we come into this place this morning that there's an awful lot of distractions that keep us from seeing you. Sometimes it's the crises of life, the health crises that I know that a number in our congregation are facing currently that make it very difficult to see you because life is really scary right now. For some, it's the financial challenges that seem to be all-consuming. For others, it's just the busyness of life and trying to keep up with everything that's on our plates. For some, it's the need to numb ourselves with entertainment, something to numb the pain. But Father, whatever the distractions are this morning, I pray that in this time together that you will help us to see you. Help us to know that you are here with us. That you are not just a God who is here in the good times. 
that you are the God who is with us in the bad. You are the God that is with us when everything seems out of control. You are the God who is with us when we feel like we are hopeless. And Father, this morning as we gather in this place, I pray that you will shine that star of your hope, of your love, of your light into each one of our hearts. That no matter what we're facing today, no matter what we're facing this week or this month, I pray that you would shine your hope into our hearts and help us to see you. Father, I am so thankful that when we calm ourselves, when we quiet ourselves, that you are here. And we take a few minutes now to silently lift up these distractions and allow ourselves to see you. have a lot of needs represented in our church. For those who are facing the challenge of cancer, for Chad and Dave, we lift them up to you and we ask for your, your miraculous touch in their situations. We ask for your peace and your presence with their family in this time. Father, we pray that you would show them in the midst of this that you are with them. Father, for those who are struggling with relationship issues, struggling with children who are choosing paths that are not the best, struggling with parents, struggling with loved ones, we ask as well that you would show them your peace and your presence in the midst of the chaos. Our way of thinking is usually to ask you to solve these problems and to fix them, fix them, fix them. This morning I ask that you would be with us in the midst of the pain and make us aware of your presence instead of us being so consumed with these things fixed. Help us to be aware of the lessons that you want to teach us in the midst of the pain and the chaos. Father, there are so many things that face in life. There's so many challenges that, that we come up against. We live in such a fast-paced world. But I pray that through our time together this morning, through our time of prayer now, through the songs that we sing, through the message, through our fellowship, that you would help us to leave this place with fresh eyes. To be able to see through clouds and through the darkness, at least a glimmer of hope, and know that you are with us. And Father, we pray together now this prayer that your son taught us, knowing that in those times when we're beyond words, that this prayer can bring great comfort and great joy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
forward at this time. We'll continue to worship and be giving our tithes and offerings. Lord, thank you for being with us in your Holy Spirit and for our fellowship together. Thank you for all that you do for everyone in this world every day in every way. Please bless our offering today. For all power, honor, praise, and glory is yours forever. Amen. as I said earlier, we are moving into the book of Lamentations this morning. And quite honestly, I've never studied the book of Lamentations, just like I've never studied the book of Jeremiah before. And I wish we had a whole lot more time in Lamentations and a little bit less time in Jeremiah, to be honest. We have this week in Jeremiah or in Lamentations, and then next week we're going to be moving back into the New Testament, into the book of Acts. But I want us to look this morning at the concept of lamentations, trusting God's faithfulness when everything falls apart. The book of Lamentations is a song of lament. Now when I say the word lament, what I mean by that is lament, it's a foreign concept to us in the American church. Lament is when we cry out for help, recognizing the pain around us, but not demanding that the pain be taken away, but crying out for God's help in the midst of the pain. I think what we see in the American church is, is a transition to God being the vending machine in the sky, God make this all better, instead of recognizing God's desire to be with us in the midst of the pain. One of the books that I'm reading this, this week on lament, on the prophetic need for lament, it talked about how in the American church we tend to have completely forgotten this concept. If you look at the, at the scriptures, the book of Psalms, which was the worship hymnal for the Jewish people, over 40% of their songs, or the Psalms, are psalms of lament. They're psalms that are crying out for God's help. But when you look at our hymnal, and we actually used it this morning, we don't very often, very few of the songs that we sing when we come together are songs of lament. Now, I don't know what the exact number is in our hymnal, but I know that the, the author of this book surveyed several hymnals from mainline churches and from Baptist churches, and what they found the highest was about 18% 
of the songs were songs of lament. And when they look at the CCLI, which is the, the Christian music licensing company that we use, because in order to project lyrics on the screen, we have to pay a fee for that, and that they track what songs that we use, and less than 5% of the songs that are projected on screens in churches across America are songs of lament. The challenge with this is that when life doesn't go the way that we want it to, we don't have much of a language to cry out to God for help in the midst of the pain. We sing songs or songs get stuck in our head that, that tend to focus on, on everything being all better. But how many of you live lives that are always all better? I know just looking across the crowd this morning, and a number of you are really struggling with a lot of stuff. Life isn't all better for, for many of us today. And so, I'm not saying anything about our music. I'm saying the culture as a whole, the church culture, has lost the sense of lament. And I think it's something that we have to, to process so that we have language when things aren't perfect to still be able to cry out to God. The book of Lamentations is a song of lament. Now, what Jeremiah is writing this song of lament about is he's grieving the destruction of Jerusalem. When Jeremiah is writing these words, he starts out just absolutely horrified at the death that has come to his city. But the loss of of Jerusalem is more than just a city, as we'll explore in just a moment. The book of Lamentations we think was written by Jeremiah. He doesn't sign it. We don't have the original copies. We don't know. But it's put together, at least in the English Bible, right with the book of of Jeremiah um, because we believe that Jeremiah wrote it after Jerusalem fell. And it clearly seems to be written shortly after Jerusalem was destroyed. There is a, a sense in this book of freshness of newness, of the grief, of the loss. But for the Jewish people, the loss of Jerusalem was not just the loss of a city. How many of you have lived in a place other than the Quad Cities at some point in your life? About half of us have lived somewhere other than the Quad Cities. Some of you have never lived outside of the Quad Cities. And so for you to lose the Quad Cities, if something were to happen in Davenport, Quad Cities were destroyed. For some of you, there's, there's a real challenge. What would life be outside of this? But for many of us, we've lived other places and we know, well, we just moved somewhere else. For the people of Jerusalem, for the people of Israel, Jerusalem wasn't just a city, although it was a city, it was their city. It was the city where everything happened that was important in the nation of Israel. Now, in in our nation, we have a lot of historical sites. We have a lot of places that are special to us. In in Washington, D.C., we certainly have a a number of of memorials. We certainly have a number of, of special buildings that tell the story of our nation. But Washington, D.C. is not the only place that you can go in America to find who we are. In fact, you can go to Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia, you can see that beautiful bell that rang so hard that it broke. That tells a part of our story. We call it the Liberty Bell. Because they broke it ringing so excited after writing or approving the the Constitution. You can go to New York City and you can see things in New York City that tell a part of our story. You can go to almost any major city in the United States and there's part of our story being told in these cities. But in Israel, there was only one one city that told their story. At the time that the temple was destroyed, there was not a temple to God anywhere in their country other than the one in Jerusalem. At different times, there had been temples built to God because of the paganism that the kings had allowed in Jerusalem. But those had been destroyed, and all that was left 
the only temple, the only place they could go to worship was in Jerusalem. But it wasn't just their city, it was also their children that had been killed. And Jeremiah spends a lot of time lamenting the lack of future because of the children who were killed in this war. And then the question comes, how do we worship God without our temple? How do we worship God when everything that we have associated with God has been destroyed? There is a deep sense of pain that we find when we look at lamentations. There's this deep sense that that life isn't what it used to be, and it never will be what it used to be. There's a deep sense of lament, of grief. Honestly, chapters 1 and 2 seem absolutely hopeless. And that's what we've read so far in Lamentations. We're going to read the good news this week. But I want us to acknowledge the hopelessness that they felt. And I also want us to acknowledge that we all go through periods of our lives where we feel hopeless. All of us do. Whether it's a medical diagnosis, whether it's the loss of someone we love, whether it's financial challenges, we all go through periods of times where we lose everything that's important. And it's important for us to find the glimmer of hope that says that even though we're going through these periods where we lose everything, God is still with us. God has not abandoned us. In chapter 3, we start to see a glimmer of hope. It's not a huge ray of sunshine, but it's a glimmer of hope. When we think about this glimmer of hope that comes in chapter 3, it kind of comes as an afterthought. The author has, has been speaking about all of the chaos. And he says, but something made me think. Something made me think. And oftentimes our glimmers of hope come at a point where We're at the end of ourselves, but something made us think. Now, because the kids are in here this morning, I told you that we would get to watch a part of Toy Story. And and the part that we're going to watch of Toy Story is, is really focused on that when everything seems lost, and then there's a glimmer of hope. Guys! Guys! Woody's riding our sea! And Buzz is with him! Telling the truth. What have we done? Great, now I have guilt. We're almost there. Rock the ramp. <laughs> Look out! <laughs> Wait, hold on to my tail.
Woody, what are you doing? Hold still, Buzz. <laughs> you did it. Next stop, Andy. Wait a minute. I just lit a rocket. Rockets explode! <laughs> the truck. Hey, wow! What? What is it? Woody! Buzz! Oh, great. You found them. Where were they? Here in the car! See? Now, what did I tell you? Right where you left them. Now, I don't know if how many of you have seen the movie Toy Story. Has anybody not seen Toy Story? There's a couple of you that haven't seen Toy Story. Now you're going to have to go watch it. This is number one, just in case you're wondering. There's three of them, at least. This is number one. There was a glimmer of hope. But the glimmer of hope is found at the end of ourselves. Now, leading up to this, I haven't watched the whole thing. I just found this clip. I can't remember exactly what happened leading up to this. I'll have to watch it again, too. But you can see in this clip that, that Buzz and Woody are trying to catch up with the moving truck because they're moving, and they got, set, they got left behind. Long story. That's the point of the movie. And they finally got away from the neighbor kid who was trying to blow them up, hence the rocket. And they were on their way to catch up to the moving truck until the batteries died. And then we see the, the match go out. Now I know that the, the creators of this movie are not Christian. I know that that was not their point. But I think it's interesting that when Woody hit his knees, that help came from above. I know that's not their point. I'm not trying to make it their point. But I'm just saying that I think it's appropriate for us. Because very often in our lives, we find ourselves constantly fighting for control, trying to control everything that's going on instead of hitting our knees and looking for help from above. Now, our American culture doesn't tell us to look for help from above. It tells us to look for help from within or around us. Control things. Control, control, control. But a glimmer of hope very often comes at the end of ourselves. A glimmer of hope comes when there's nothing else that we can do. Now for Woody and Buzz at that moment, as the batteries were dead and the match was blown out, had been blown out by the car, there's nothing else that they could do. And I think very often in our lives, the glimmer of hope comes when there's nothing else that we can do. Because we have to realize that we don't control as much as we think we control. So much of our American culture, so much of our advertising is all focused on how we can control everything. We earn money so that we can buy things that put us in control. But how many of you have been in a situation where you're out of control 
and money can't fix it. I think all of us can raise our hand on that. Wednesday night, anybody enjoy the rain that we got on Wednesday night? I'm sitting back here as we're having our lesson for our kids programming, and the message comes across severe thunderstorm warning. No watch, just straight to warning. So I'm sitting in the sound booth, running the sound for Janelle as she's teaching the lesson, and I'm watching this, and I've got the radar pulled up, because I'm good at controlling the weather, you know. Our policy on Wednesday nights, when we've got the kids here on vans, is if it's going, if there's a severe thunderstorm watch or a warning, we just don't have it. I don't put our workers, I don't put our kids at the risk. If there's a severe thunderstorm possibility, I'm not going to have church. Same thing with the the cold or the snow. If there's a watch or a warning, I'm just going to cancel it. But I'm sitting back there in in the sound booth, right where Chad's sitting, and I'm looking at the weather channel. I'm looking at the radar, and the radar is telling me that the rain is not going to hit us until about 11.30. At the moment, it was 7.15. I thought, I'm good. I checked it a couple more times as we went through the evening just to make sure we're good. So after we finish with the lesson at 7.30, it's time to load up the vans. And so we get the first group of kids on the van, and all of a sudden it starts to rain. And the lightning comes, and it is intense. The first stop that I have is up here at at Castlewood Apartments, and it just so happened that they didn't think it was going to rain either, and so Wednesday they sealed the parking lot which means that I can't even drive the kids into the apartment complex to drop them off. Now, it is raining, and it is lightning like crazy. And so I call the mother, and I say, where can I drop these kids off? Because I can't, I can't even pull into the front of the apartment complex. I, they were up front waiting for me, but I'm not going to leave them up front when they live at the back of the apartment complex. So the mother says, just bring them around back, and I'll be waiting. So I bring them around back. There's a fence in between the apartment complex and Emi's Park. And so I see Mother standing out on the porch, and I think, great, the road butts up against their apartment, that's awesome. Except the gate is way in the middle of the complex, and they live way at this end of the complex. And the kids, of course, the lightning is going crazy, and the kids are going crazy, and they're scared, and they're screaming. But I've got to get them home. Now, I'm one that watches the weather, on Wednesdays in particular, because I want to be in control. But on Wednesday, I couldn't control it. And so what else did I do? I started to pray. And I got the kids off the van, and Mom was waving for us to, to send them on, and I'm sitting there just praying as I watch them run, as the lightning is flashing all around us. God, please keep these kids safe and get them inside. We get them home, and, and they're, they're safe. I get back on the van, and I start driving again to my next stop. I get those kids inside, and I start headed back to the church for, to pick up the second route. And all of a sudden, the rain comes down in sheets, and I can't even see where I'm going. We drive real slow, and we make it back. We get to the church, and, and I get ready to load up the second load of kids. And, and I look at the radar, and... The radar says that this is going to be done in a few minutes. So I send a text to the parents. I say, we're going to wait this out. We'll we'll have them home soon, but we're going to wait a few minutes. And it doesn't slow down. In fact, the radar just keeps populating right where it said it would end. It just, so finally after about a half an hour, I get the second load on on the van and we text the parents and, and tell them we're, we're bringing them, and I call them as soon as we pull up and say, hey, we've got the kids here, open the door, because they're going to run in, and they, they get in. And three different places where we drive, there's, there's stalled out cars because the, water, the roads were flooded. There was six inches in the west end of Davenport, and, and I saw most of it. You see, I'm one that likes to control everything when it comes to making sure that we keep kids safe on Wednesday nights. And Wednesday night, I realized I don't control anything. In fact, we finally got all the kids home safely, and we got home safely, and 
And I'm laying in, in bed looking out the window and just watching the storm. Just in case you're wondering, the meteorologists at the Weather Channel, at least, I didn't watch the local news, but the meteorologists at the Weather Channel had no clue what was happening with the storm. Because they kept saying it was done in a few minutes, and it just kept coming. We live in a culture where we like to control things. I love to control things. In fact, I love it when my electronics can control things. Because you see, I have buttons on my phone or on my iPad, and all I have to do is hit that button, and it controls what happens here. Because I like control. In fact, if you look behind you, I set up a new control back there this week so it's actually a different looking screen and there's a timer up there so I can tell if I'm preaching too long. Doesn't mean I'm going to stop, but it's there. I like to control things. I, I live to control things. But a glimmer of hope comes when we realize that we can't control what we think we can control. If you have your Bibles, let's open up to the book of Lamentations. Chapter 3. And I'm going to start reading in verse 20. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. Now that's the way the New Living Translation translates it. Just so you know, the way that, that the Hebrew reads, and some of your translations may read, the thought of my suffering and homelessness is, it says, wormwood and gall. That's disgusting. It's the stuff that they gave to Jesus when he was on the cross that he spit out. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. This is the key phrase in this passage. Everything is hopeless, bitter, and gall. Everything is hopeless until Jeremiah remembers this. The faithful of the love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. Great is thy faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I said to myself, the Lord is my inheritance, therefore I will hope in Him. The Lord is good to those who depend on Him, to those who search for Him. So it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. And it is good for people to submit at an early age to the yoke of His discipline. Let them sit alone in silence beneath the Lord's demands. Let them lie face down in the dust, for there may be hope at last. Let them turn the other cheek to those who strike them and accept the insults of their enemies, for no one is abandoned by the Lord forever. A glimmer of hope. For though he brings grief, he also shows compassion because of the greatness of his unfailing love, for he does not enjoy hurting people or causing them sorrow. A glimmer of hope. You'll notice that this glimmer of hope does not come from Jeremiah. There's nothing that Jeremiah can do to bring hope into the situation where everything he knows has been destroyed. And as the passage I believe that we read today said, even the children that he had loved and invested in were killed in this tragedy. Hope doesn't come from Jeremiah. And hope doesn't come from the mess either. It's not like Jeremiah is looking at, at the rubble around him, the smoldering ashes, and saying, there's hope in these ashes. But the hope, the glimmer of hope, comes from God. And I think in our situations, in our lives, we need to remember this as well. Because my default, my, my way of functioning is when I start to feel hopeless, I start looking around to what can I do to make this better? Or what can somebody else do to make this better? And unfortunately, I think it's human nature that the last place that I look 
is up when it should be the first place that I look. The hope doesn't come from me. It doesn't come from anybody else. It comes from God. And Jeremiah remembers. He remembers God's covenant. When it says, great is thy faithfulness, the, the word for faithfulness there is a, is a hard word to, to translate. It's actually the word has said. Chesed is probably how it's pronounced. But it's looking at the faithful covenant of God with his people. And it's used to symbolize the fact that even though the people continued to fail and break the covenant, God remained faithful. Jeremiah remembers the love of God. He remembers the compassion of God. He remembers that God's mercies are new every morning. You know, with, with all of the rain that was coming on Wednesday night, is, I think it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, a really severe stretch of this came through and woke me up, woke all the girls up in our house. And, and as I was sitting on the edge of the bed after the girls were back asleep, and I was staring out of the window just watching the lightning constantly, and, and the house was shaking with the, the rolling thunder. I felt absolutely out of control, and I was reminded of, of those who were experiencing Hurricane Harvey and how hopeless that must have felt, just watching the rain continue to come. But I had this assurance that even though at that point the Weather Channel had no clue what was happening and the radar was not showing what was happening, I had the assurance that morning was coming. And according to the Weather Channel, the rain would be done by 5 o'clock. It wasn't, but according to them, it was going to be. I knew that morning was coming. The author remembers that God is faithful. The author remembers that God is his inheritance. What does he mean by that? He means that his hope for eternity rests in God. No matter how hopeless our storms may seem, our hope comes from the fact that our inheritance is in God. And whether we experience the hope that we want on this side or on that side, it's coming. God is our inheritance. That's what the author remembered, but here's what God said that he needed to do. First of all, he needed to wait on God. And I think in our fast-paced culture, we don't wait very well. We push, 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 and we're not quiet, and we don't wait. Specifically, next, the, the author says that we need to wait in silence. We need to submit to the discipline, the yoke of discipline. And Jeremiah says that the younger that we are when we learn to submit to that, the better. But we also have to come to the end of ourselves. We have to come to the end of our thinking that we can control this. And we have to remember again that God's love is forever. The discipline will only last a while. With grief comes compassion. And God's love is unfailing. So as our worship team comes and as we prepare to close... I want us to sing Great is Thy Faithfulness again if we could. Perhaps this morning we need to remember the love of God and the compassions of God and that He is our inheritance. Perhaps we need to this morning learn to wait on God. And perhaps sometime today or in the next few days we need to take time to wait in silence without the screens going around us, without the music, just to wait on Him in silence. Perhaps there's something that God's trying to communicate to us, a lesson that He wants us to learn in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of this challenge. But ultimately, we have to come to the end of ourselves. We have to acknowledge that we don't control what we think we can control. We can't think our way through it. We can't power our way through it. We can't 
build relationships to get through it. We can't control it. There are some things in this life that we just can't control. And we have to come to the end of ourselves. Perhaps this morning we need to remember that great is thy faithfulness. Let's stand together as we close.